I know what's ahead. I could feel the future. From a producer of Top Gun Maverick and based on the award-winning novels by Isaac Asimov comes the next Apple TV Plus streaming event. Empire and our foundation headed for war. This could change everything. The foundation is a threat to my empire. We will destroy them. We are taking the planet! Foundation, the new season, streaming July 14th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of Who Killed. I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've had a great week. And with all the negativity that's been going on in the world, I wanted to change up this week's format and bring something that wasn't such a downer as some episodes can be. If you've followed me on Twitter over the past two years, you will have realized that I have become obsessed with audiobooks. And I probably consume about three books per week. I, of course, at first devoured some of the best true crime books. Then I branched out to fiction, and that's not what I want to talk to you about today. I actually want to talk to you about the crime books, because, again, this is a crime show. But, again, I said this wasn't going to be a downer episode, so I have mixed in a few different titles that don't require somebody getting murdered. Crime was committed, but it was just not that particular crime. And, again, these are arranged in no particular order, but I assure you that I found something great about each of these books and something I think that each and every one of you will find great. If you love true crime podcasts, I so strongly recommend you check out the Overdrive or Libby app where you can listen to audiobooks for free as long as you have a local library card. And I'm not kidding when I tell you that this app has provided me thousands of hours of free entertainment and knowledge. Here's my short PSA. Go get a library card from your local library. It's free, and it's fantastic. So, let's dive into the books that I loved so much that they made this list. And the first book that I recommend is a truly unbelievable and brazen crime that it really deserves its own movie, and it probably will get one. And I'm talking about The Billion Dollar Whale. The Man Who Fooled Wall Street, Hollywood, and the World, written by Tom Wright and Bradley Hope. And according to the book's own description, quote, Billion Dollar Whale is the epic true tale of hubris and greed from two Pulitzer finalist Wall Street Journal reporters. Billion Dollar Whale reveals how a young social climber pulled off one of the biggest financial heists in history right under the nose of the global financial industry. Exposing the shocking secret nexus of elite wealth, banking, Hollywood, and politics. The Guardian describes the 1MDB scandal at the heart of the book, where they state the money funded the ostentatious lifestyle of one of the consultants allegedly brought in to oversee 1MDB, Malaysian businessman Joe Lowe. The Guardian goes on to detail some of the crazy spending Lowe bankrolled while overseeing this account. Tens of billion dollars worth of property in Beverly Hills and Manhattan, including an apartment once owned by Jay-Z and Beyonce, a $35 million private jet, a $260 million yacht, a $3.2 million Picasso given to Leonardo DiCaprio, a paltry $85 million in Las Vegas gambling debts, a birthday party for Low, where Jamie Foxx, Chris Brown, Ludacris, Buster Rhymes, and Pharrell Williams performed live, and Britney Spears apparently jumped out of a cake. And then there was $8 million in diamonds for Australian model Miranda Kerr. The irony of all ironies is the fact that tens of millions of dollars also went towards funding the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which is all about defrauding investors. And, to make matters worse, 1MDB was a Malaysian state fund that was set up in 2009 to promote development through foreign investment and partnerships. The U.S. Justice Department believes that more than $4.5 billion was stolen, and they allege that the embezzlement actually occurred from 2009 to 2012, but eh, nobody really mattered or cared about it until 2015, so that's pretty cool. And adding insult to injury, uh, Lowe maintains that he's innocent, and 
he is still on the run. My thoughts about this book are strap in for a wild ride. It will show you almost every person turning a blind eye to the fact that this low character was so young and so rich and literally just throwing money all around. It was insane. And it's just crazy that his connections to the Malaysian government have been able to keep him off the radar and he's never been held accountable for his crimes. You know, the... (laughs) This is crazy. The Picasso that he gave Leo as a gift for the Wolf of Wall Street movie had to be returned to Malaysian authorities as part of an effort to reap back the $4.5 billion that was stolen from the account. Again, I say that this is a five-star book. The impeccable authors do an exquisite job of detailing Lowe's crimes. So if you enjoy white-collar crime and corruption then Billion Dollar Whale is for you. Now, the next book on the list is currently in the news, and that is Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup by John Carreyrou. Quote, the full inside story of the breathtaking rise and shocking collapse of a multi-billion dollar startup by the prize-winning journalist who first broke the story and pursued it to the end in the face of pressure and threats from the CEO and her lawyers. Now, Elizabeth Holmes was the founder of this company, and she's currently facing trial for her crimes. While this episode is airing, actually, I think the opening statements are this week. So she's made some wild claims that she plans to use as a defense. So we'll have to wait and see what happens at the end of the trial. But if you like stories about startups and how they can bamboozle some of the really intelligent people, then you should pick this book up. I mean, it was in 2014 when Theranos founder and CEO Elizabeth Holmes was being groomed as the next Steve Jobs, a brilliant quote-unquote Stanford dropout whose startup unicorn promised to revolutionize the medical industry with a machine that would make blood tests significantly faster and easier. She was able to dupe really serious investors like Larry Ellison and Tim Draper, and they sold shares, Theranos sold shares in a fundraising round that valued the company at $9 billion and put Holmes' net worth right around $4.7 billion. There was just a slight little issue with the technology, and uh, that was the fact that it didn't work. (laughs) Now, Holmes was always dressed in her Steve Jobs-esque black turtleneck and was able to persuade investors, FDA officials, as well as her own employees that her finger prick prick blood reader worked as promised. And again, it was author John Carreyrou who was working at the Wall Street Journal when he heard from a former Theranos employee, and then he started asking questions. The newspaper ran dozens of articles about the company, and, of course, Holmes and Theranos threatened lawsuits after lawsuits, and luckily they stuck with it, and it turned out to be an unbelievable book and an excellent documentary on HBO. So who would like this book? Well, people who enjoy tales of con men or con women and corruption. And that's just the tip of that little iceberg. There's so much about this story that's crazy. I highly recommend the book. You must check it out. It really is one of the greatest tales of just blind faith, I guess you could call it. So the next one I want to talk about takes us back to the hippie 60s of California. And that is chaos. Charles Manson, the CIA, and the secret history of the 60s by Tom O'Neill with a contributor, Dan Pippenbring. Now, this is a wide-ranging story, not only about the Manson family murders, but a personal journey as author Tom O'Neill spends nearly two decades researching the case that shocked the world and the prosecutor at the heart of the trial. It's a very, very detailed book, And O'Neill actually uncovers how the FBI was involved in the case. And people who know true crime know about the Manson murders. Hell, you don't even need to know about true crime to know about this case. It was two nights in Los Angeles where the followers of 
this little man named Charles Manson murdered seven people, including the famous Sharon Tate, who was unfortunately eight months pregnant. The Goodreads description goes on to say, quote, with no mercy and seemingly no motive, the Manson family followed the leader's every order. Their crimes lit a flame of paranoia across the nation, spelling the end of the 60s. Manson became one of history's most infamous criminals, his name forever attached to an era when charlatans mixed with prodigies, free love was as possible as brainwashing, and utopia or dystopia was just an acid trip away. Yeah, this book is really, really wild, and it's something that becomes an obsession for O'Neill, and he just goes into endless amounts of detail about, you know, Helter Skelter and the prosecutor and how close the Beach Boys were to the Manson family, and it's it's so interesting. And then there's the whole connection between the CIA running secret tests at certain labs or certain clinics, I should say, in San Francisco that offered, you know, therapy via acid. And that was one of the ways that they were testing the truth serum at the time. So it kind of goes and details the story about Charles Manson and his connection as well as the family's connection to this one particular clinic that has been associated with one of the CIA's test labs, I guess you could call it. And it's pretty intriguing, especially since none of this stuff was really ever brought up in trial or was it ever really discussed before the book. So definitely would recommend this book if you like true crime, if you like the Manson murders, but you want to know more about what actually went on behind the scenes, then this book is for you because, again, O'Neill really takes his time to take a deep dive into this case. I mean, he spent 20 years researching this. I mean, it started off as an article that he was supposed to write for a company that eventually went out of business before he was even able, even able to finish the article. So it's just pretty wild that he was able to get it all together and it's very interesting and it's a different take than Helter Skelter. I recommend this for everybody because it's super interesting because it's not just one crazy story about the Manson family. It's many, many, many crazy stories about who was involved and what could have led the followers and Manson himself to go down this crazy road of cult life. I mean, we see a lot of it today. Nobody's immune to being sucked into a cult. So unfortunately, uh, in the 60s, with free love and kids just running away from home, it was a lot easier to get people to follow you. But again, look around today and ask yourself if things have really changed all that much. Because, yeah, cult life, it's a thing. Not cool. So, anyway, moving on. Now, this next book, again, is a very... How do you say it? What would, what would I say? It, it's very of the times. And that is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. Quote, the highly anticipated portrait of three generations of the Sackler family by the prize-winning, best-selling author of Say Nothing. Anyone who has been following the ongoing opioid crisis in America has to know the name Purdue Pharma and their owners, the Sacklers. Their name is on the walls of places such as Harvard, the Met, Oxford University, the Louvre, and that's just to name a few. I mean, they became known as some of the largest philanthropists in the world, but nobody really knew exactly where their money came from. But it turns out they're the ones who own Purdue Pharma. And guess who's at Purdue Pharma? They're the ones that supply Oxycontin and own the patent. And, well, if you have Patrick Radden Keefe on your tail, I'm sorry, but he is going to take a extremely close look at your ties to the industry. It goes all the way back to Raymond Mortimer. And I mean, just those names alone are just like old school rich. 
this guy, I mean, the Sackler family, just to give you a brief idea of how they had bamboozled the medical industry. Sackler, Raymond Sackler, I think it was Raymond, owned one of the medical journals that was popular at the time that would also market his medications. And he also had a deal with the FDA, I mean, the head of the FDA, where the head of the FDA would get certain percentages for the amount of drugs that were sold through the industry. So this is a crazy, crazy tale of one family's greed based off of a junk science study from the 1980s that was a controlled experiment study about the addiction percentage of people and opioids. And they used this to basically let have Congress say, okay, you can market these pain as a, an issue and apparently you know, you're giving us a good reason to open this door, open Pandora's box and oh, guess what? It turns out opioids are actually extremely addictive and that has led our country down the path of the opioid crisis. That's why we have a 290% increase in opioid deaths over the last year. I mean, this is insane. Oxycontin has been the root of all evil, but at the end of the day, it's what Oxycontin leads to. Its high price leads to people who get addicted. It leads them to getting on heroin, and then people take heroin that's laced with fentanyl and they die. And that's pretty much a common occurrence these days. It's just ridiculous. I mean, Omar Little, Michael Kenneth Williams from The Wire, one of my favorite actors, just died on Sunday or Monday from heroin-laced fentanyl. I mean, this is ridiculous. And the Sacklers just completed a some multi-billion dollar uh, settlement with the country. But at the end of the day, these people don't really lose any money of their own. And it's not like they have to give back the $13 billion that they made in the process of literally dumping oxys all over the country. I mean, one of the Sacklers was said to have written in a memo, it's going to be a blizzard of pills, something along those lines, a blizzard of white. It's just insane. I mean, these people are absolute criminals and yet they don't actually get held accountable other than a slap on the wrist and a fine and yes Purdue Pharma did have to dissolve and and all oh, yada 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 but and it, it's at the end of the day that doesn't explain to the millions of families who have lost loved ones to the crisis what do they get out of this i mean they don't see any justice in a fine i mean give me a break I mean, this company makes billions and you're going to give them a $7 billion. Ah, just drives me nuts. It's like when they give Google like a billion dollar fine. Don't do that. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. They make way more than that. All right. I'm going to calm down here. All right. Let's go back to murder. <laughs> because I can't stand the Sacklers. They're just trash. And let's go into Night Stalker, The Life and Crimes of Richard Ramirez by Philip Carlo. And again, this is another story that is kind of in the news because there's a Netflix documentary that was based off of this book. According to Goodreads, they say that Carlo painstakingly researched over three years based on nearly 100 hours of exclusive interviews with not only Richard Ramirez and California's death row, but with other people along the way. And Carlo goes into Ramirez's earliest brushes with the law to his deadliest stalking expeditions to the unprecedented police and civilian manhunted that resulted in one of the most sensational trials in California history. The Night Stalker is an eerie and spellbinding descent into the very heart of human evil. This week's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. 
This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious, calorie-smart, and protein-smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes, too. HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats, like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonese slaw, and pineapple relish, or a snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. So go to HelloFresh.com slash WhoKilled16 and use the code who killed 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash who killed 16 and use who killed 16 for 16 meals plus free shipping. Okay, so Night Stalker. I was a little kid when the Night Stalker was arrested. I have a nightmare every once in a while of him... I mean, it's not a nightmare. I mean, it's just a vision of him holding up his hand with the satanic uh, symbol on his palm while he was in trial. I mean, he was such a weirdo. I mean, he would smile at the victims. Uh, this guy was just gross. But the greatest thing about how he was caught is that this was an actual citizen's arrest where he was trying to commit a, an assault and a group of people well, stepped in and literally chased him around the city, cornered him, beat the crap out of him, waited until police came, and then he was arrested. The thing about Richard Ramirez is he was insanely proficient in a short amount of time. I mean, this guy was raping and killing. He was the epitome of evil. I mean, the definition of evil. And I think that's really, at the end of the day, what he wanted you to believe he was, especially with his his antics at the court. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You give this guy an opportunity to kind of, I don't know, prune for the cameras, and uh, not a good idea, at least in my opinion. But at least he's not a problem, and I think he just died recently. So uh, rest in hell there, Richard Ramirez. But if you want a really, really good book or you want to watch a good documentary, definitely recommend Richard Ramirez, The Night Stalker. And then, last but not least, we're going to keep this short and sweet this week, Facebook, The Inside Story by Stephen Levy. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Facebook it didn't do any crimes, yeah? Well... Eh, I guess that depends on who you ask. Because, uh, technically speaking, no, this isn't a true crime book, but it is a crime against humanity. I mean, Facebook can be either seen as this little nice social app that helps you connect with grandma, but if you could also be seen as this flashpoint for our current state of being... Zuck has become a supervillain in many people's eyes for not just being young, rich, and influential, but for how he has used those powers to increase his wealth while literally watching democracy burn. And Facebook isn't just causing problems here. He has been associated with assisting a coup in Myanmar that allegedly led to genocide. Not quite the accusation Mark Zuckerberg could have fathomed, when he created the campus social network in his dorm room for a mere thousands of dollars. And again, Facebook has become its own worst enemy, as they have run over the smaller tech companies by purchasing them and literally kicking out their founders. Now, one good story is when Zuck tried to buy Snapchat a couple times, even up to $3 billion. And its founder, Evan Spiegel, told him to kiss his ass. Zuck's immaturity and totally expected reaction was to just build his own version of Snapchat that he threatened Spiegel would destroy his little app. Problem is, the product sucked and Spiegel was rewarded for turning down Zuck when he took Snap public and his company was valued at more than $35 billion and little Evan was now worth $6 billion himself. Double what Zuck offered for the whole company. So I guess it's safe to say Zuck doesn't always get his way and Facebook doesn't always get the company they want. But Spiegel is probably an outlier. Most people would have trouble turning down billions of dollars. And 
Spiegel came from wealth, so it may have been easier for him to say no, but look at Instagram. They kicked out the founder just a few years after Facebook bought them for $1 billion. Facebook is a tech giant and a bully, and they are the largest social media platform and one of the most humongous companies in the world. Uh, Their valuation of $576 billion, and they claim to have 3 billion users. Goodread states, quote, There is no denying the power and omnipresence of Facebook and American daily life, and in light of recent controversies surrounding election influencing fake news accounts, the handling of its users' personal data, and growing discontent with the actions of its founder and CEO, never has the company been more central to the national conversation. Based on hundreds of interviews inside and outside the company, Levy's sweeping narrative digs deep into the whole story of the company that has changed the world and reaped the consequences. So, who would like this book? Well, people who hate Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, first of all, and I'm sure there are a lot of those. And it's kind of a book about the power of responsibility, or the responsibility of power, I should say. Because if you don't handle it responsibly, well, it can lead to a genocide, and that's not good for anybody. So I just wanted to recommend this book to anyone who enjoys hating on Zuck or wants to know more about Facebook and wants to know more about how they have become the behemoth that they are and the bully that they've become. And it's really, it's it's so detailed. And Levy, I mean, he's a longtime tech journalist. So this is a great study of Mark Zuckerberg as a person as well as Facebook as a company and how some of the stuff that they have tried and failed, you know, it, it's, he gets a lot of um, inside information straight from Mark Zuckerberg. But again, he also details how he changes throughout the years and how he's become more, I don't know what the word, the proper word is to describe this, but he's just not as candid anymore because he doesn't see it, how it would benefit him, benefit him. I mean, he is so rich now that it doesn't matter. And Facebook is like this giant fly that you just can't swat. I mean, it just won't go away and it keeps causing problems. I mean, Facebook used to be the cool thing. It's not the cool thing anymore. You can talk about your users and how many users you have, but kids don't use Facebook. Kids use Snapchat. Kids use other stuff. But Facebook is for your grandma and for your mom and whatever. I mean, it's fine. People like Facebook. I'm not knocking Facebook. I'm just knocking Zuckerberg because he is a tyrant. And if you see any of his testimony or you read this book or have watched The Social Network, then you understand where I'm coming from. And there are a lot of people out there that feel the same way about him. So give the book a chance. It may sound like a glowing coverage at the beginning, but it evolves. So give Stephen Levy a lot of credit for covering this company from the beginning. And it's amazing how a company that grows from a dorm room to literally the largest social media platform in the world. It's an insane tale, but it's also a cautionary tale. Because, again, it could be (laughs) handled so much more responsibly. And yes, Sheryl Sandberg is there, but the buck stops with Zuck. And I'll leave it at that. So thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. As you know, I drop new episodes every Friday. And... If you'd like to donate to the show, you can do so via the Venmo app using my username at bill-huffman-3. I'll try to provide a link in the show notes. I think I forgot the past couple weeks. Or you can find me on PayPal as well. 
And again, you can also review the show. Give me a five-star review, and that will help keep the shows I cover in the spotlight. And again, if you want to know what shows I have coming down the pipeline, you can also follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you to the authors for writing these amazing books. I have so many more that I would love to discuss, but I don't have that much time to talk about it this week. So just wanted to bring you guys something a little bit more lighthearted. And with that being said, thank you so much again for tuning in. And until next week, be healthy and stay safe. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night, or objects in the sky, or other things you just couldn't explain? Then join me, Jim Howard, on my podcast, The Mowered Report. Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mowered Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.